Yeah, welcome back. It's still uh, Plus Politics and my name is Nyamgul Agadi. Before now, we were talking about the fact that people are calling on uh, the judiciary or the courts to open their doors so that the proceedings of the election tribunals could be televised and people get to know what is happening. And we had Tunji Abdul Hamid on the show and also Ayo was here, both of them learned gentlemen. But right now, we're looking at the reaction to the 2023 elections. The EU observation mission on Monday faulted the Independent National Electoral Commission, INEC, for failing to live up, live up to the expectations of Nigeria's electoral process. The chief observer, EU election observation mission, Barry Andrews, in his preliminary statement of the EU EOM, on the governorship and the state houses of assembly elections said Nigerians hungered for democracy and were ready to be involved in the country's democracy. However, he noted the appetite was lost due to failures by the political elite and INEC. Joining us to discuss this is Michael Kwado Nkesia, International Relations Analyst. Good evening and welcome to the program. Thanks for having me on the show. Okay. Well, um, expectations before and after the elections. Let's get to talk about that. Let me hear your comments. How you felt the pulse of Nigerians before the election and then after the election, especially the governorship election? Well, I believe um, the elections in particular were highly, highly anticipated. Over here in Ghana, there was so much public interest, especially among young people, young Ghanaians, about the likely outcomes of the Nigerian elections. And uh, I must say that we are quite disappointed a bit with the voter turnout that we had in the presidential elections in particular. We believe that given Nigeria's large population size and the now total number of registered voters, it was very, very disappointing that we had less than 30% or so of registered voters actually turning out to cast their ballots. And of course, we, we, we were obvious or we were aware of instances of delayed electoral materials, perceived attacks, intimidation, vigilantism, the use of tax and other criminal gangs to disrupt the electoral process. Those were some of the disappointment that we witnessed in Ghana here, because those are things that we are we have been trying so hard and we do so well to get rid of in Ghana's electoral system. We were hoping that our brothers and sisters in Nigeria could emulate it, but unfortunately, we never saw it as such. And then we were quite impressed by the performance of the candidate of the Labour Party. Mr. Peter Obi. In our political environment, despite virtually an impossible task for a third force or even an independent candidate to challenge the two major political parties in Ghana, just like Nigeria has seen the dominance of the PDP and the APC since Nigeria's return to uh, constitutional rule in 1999, Ghana has equally seen or become a two-party state between the incumbent or ruling new patriotic party and the opposition agency. And we, people have been advocating civil society, uh, the middle class, so-called interest. They've been advocating for a third force, a force that, that can come out with a little bit of a, something new. A new party, a new grouping of people with, with an ideology that depends from what is espoused by the two major political parties that we have in Ghana. And we are so, so impressed by the performance of Mr. Peter Udi, the Labour Party. Although he did not win the presidential elections, although it, we must also admit that it is still a disputed electoral outcome, which, which is going to be decided by the courts, we believe that his performance was spectacular for, for, for a third force to emerge in, 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 in the tepsy tepsy nature of Nigerian politics. We believe that was a very encouraging performance. And of course, there's, that, that's one area that perhaps Ghana too could learn from going into the next elections in 2024. We believe that the elections 
Um, it wasn't that peaceful. We had incidents of pockets of violence, and then there were also claims of brutal fraud and whole lot of uh, allegations. Although the court is yet to decide on that, we believe that Nigeria has more room to improve with the conduct of its elections going forward. Okay, uh, well, let's just take on some of the things that you said here. When we take the specifics, I'm sure that we are going to cover the, the little time that we have uh, on the program today, on this segment. Well, you, you made mention of the fact that uh, Ghana was interested, and I'm sure it's not only Ghana on the African continent that was interested in our election. And then we also are concerned about the standing of a, a, a country like Nigeria in the international community and among other African countries uh, after this election. So let's just take them uh, one after the other. I know that you just talked about all these things broadly, but let's take them specifically. How do you think the outcome of this election will affect other African countries? First, democratically, this, the electoral outcome, Nigeria's electoral outcome is going to serve as an incentive to, to, to these so-called smaller political parties in other way, neighboring West African countries or even across the African continent. And yes, even if it's happening in Nigeria, we can equally do it in our country. So it's going to serve as a, as, as a moral booster for these third, uh, third forces or smaller minorities, uh, minority parties to that come together and form a third force to challenge the status quo or uh, uh, it's also going to serve as a great motivation for people who have for years considered the thoughts or have the thoughts of, of voting for a third party, but are not so confident in themselves that their votes can actually bring a third party to power or even bring that third party to some level of national political prominence. So first, it is going to be the morale of political parties, and second, it is going to be the morale of individuals who are tired of the establishment, individuals, the masses who are tired of the status quo, and it would serve as a very, very big incentive for them to join other smaller political parties and also uh, become a third force in their respective political climate or environment. Aside that, one thing is also very obvious. Nigerians, I believe, should be a little bit grateful to a man like Peter Obi. This is a candidate who targeted young people Nigeria, his message, listening to him almost every single day, resonated with a, with a, with a, the, 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 the cry and, and wailings of young people in Nigeria. He, he talked about issues of corruption, issues of the lack of productivity among the uh, uh, public service, and then he talked about issues of sustainable development, bringing sustainable jobs for the young people of Nigeria. And these are some of the topical issues that resonate with Nigeria's youthful population and also Africa's youthful population. Remember that more than 50% of the continent's population fall uh, within the youth bracket. And, and in this sense, uh, they, 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 their approach to target the youth in Nigeria worked to perfection. And I believe other political parties should them with it. Now, in addition, beyond targeting the youth, I mean, we know that one easy avenue common as in common platform for the youth across the globe is social media. And we saw not Peter Obi as an individual, but how his supporters, campaigners, loyalists were spreading his message almost every now and then on Facebook, on Twitter, on other social media platforms. It tells you about the growing influence of, of, of social media in Africa's uh, elect uh, political outcomes for elections and democracy. And in Ghana, social media has become the single most important tool for political communication and then and, and, and consensus building. Young people across the political divide are always engaged in one form or another form of banter on social media, predominantly Facebook and Twitter, always arguing about government policies that they are chastising government they are publicizing government achievements or they are praising government's achievements. I remember during the COVID, the peak of the COVID-19 pandemic, one of the tools or media that the president of Ghana used so well in conveying his COVID-19 address to the nation 
raw social media, you can see people waiting in thousands, 50,000 people, 100,000 people on the president's official Facebook account every Sunday evening just to listen to the president address the nation about the COVID-19 pandemic. People were no longer even watching TV. And it tells political parties, political strategies and leaders on the continent that the youth of Africa are very much into social media. If you strategize, if you plan well, if you execute it well, social media is a very easy, accessible, common, albeit cheap platform or less affordable platform to reach out to young people who are desperate to be part of the political decision-making process. As an international relations analyst, I'd like to ask you this. Uh, some Nigerians are worried that the outcome of the election was not as, you know, as much as was expected, especially by the international community. And the worry is that it may erode the respect that Nigeria had in the Committee of Nations. Do you think there is really something to fear that much? about Nigeria losing its respect in the international community, or do we still have some hope? Well, that, that is a very interesting assertion, and I come from the angle that it's an interesting assertion. First, for the international community, or even Nigerians themselves, to doubt the authenticity of the electoral outcome or the electoral process, it, it, it must first begin with um, a clear, indisputable evidence of various forms of electoral malpractices that, that, that were captured either on paper or that, 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 that have been captured by variety or a wide range of electoral observers. As I indicated earlier, the outcome of the Nigerian election is still being contested in court. And I, I would be very, very happy. Ghana set the precedence in 2012 when we allow the camera into our courtroom, that was the first time in the history of our country that a court case was telecasted live or carried live on national television and various social media platforms for everybody to see what was happening in the courtroom and whether the so-called allegations of electoral malpractices and, and fraud were actually perpetrated to aid the electoral victory of one candidate over the other. And I believe that I am praying, I don't know whether that process has already begun, I'm praying that the Nigerian uh, Chief Justice or Judicial Service in Nigeria, the Chief Justice would allow camera into the courtroom so that the whole world would know whether the allegations of voter reagan and fraud, as alleged by the Labour Party, as alleged by the um, PDP, the Progressive Development Party, and then uh, PPP, and then as alleged by other smaller uh, political groups like the Congress Party and NPP in Nigeria, whether all those allegations hold substance or they are, they are, they are issues that the, the play petitioners can actually in a court of law. If they are able to do so, of course, it is going to put a lot of uh, credibility questions on, on Nigeria's emerging democracy and it is going to put a lot of doubt on the credibility of Nigeria's independent national electoral commission. However, failure by both parties, the Labour Party or by Articles Party, the PDP, to prove beyond all reasonable doubt in any competent court of jurisdiction that indeed there were electoral more practices, there were voter fraud, things were initiated to aid the electoral victory of Bola Ahmed Tinubu and the all progressive Congress. If they fail to do that, then I think that Nigeria's democracy would stand firm and the whole world will know that indeed the elections were free and fair. So for the international community or Nigerians themselves to either doubt the authenticity of the results and to have some form of undermined confidence in Nigeria's democracy it very much depends on what the petitioners will be able to prove in court to show to the whole world whether the elections were rigged or not. And through that process and by whatever form of judgment or verdict that we made, I believe that's, that should be the basis for a very, very thorough 
analysis of, of the impact of the outcome of the U.S. elections on the country's democracy. Michael, I'd like to thank you for uh, that. And we do hope that Nigeria, the giant of Africa, as we like to call ourselves, and the entire West African sub-region will be uh, better than it was a long time ago, maybe 10 years ago, five years ago, because of our political climate. If it changes, the leadership changes, the commitment to leadership changes and everything changes, and then the people will be happy. I do hope that um, we'll get there one day. Thank you so much for coming on the program today, Michael. Thank you very much. Okay, we've been talking with Michael Nketsia, uh, a, an international relations analyst, uh, talking to us from Ghana on Plus Politics today. We do hope that uh, you had a wonderful time watching. From the entire crew of Plus Politics, my name is Nyamgul Agaji, saying bye for now.